What I want to do is I want to end the night by talking about medicine and I want to talk about the earth. And what I want to do is I want to talk about a, a sacred medicine amongst my people. It's a, uh, in our language, we would refer to it as openic. It's a sacred medicine that comes from the earth and we extract it from the land and we bring it into our lives and we uh, take it into our houses and we add things to it, we cut it up. Elders say that a household can be judged by their use of aponic and the ability to create this most sacred of medicines in a household. You may be wondering what this medicine is called in English and loosely translated, it means potato salad. <laughs> this story is about my people. It's also my work and about potato salad. Now stay with me. Every summer I make a pilgrimage. These days I leave my home and I go out to Selkirk where I grew up. I travel up the highway and on one side I see the rich fertile agriculture on one side and the Red River on the other. I see a small white building off on the other side of the river. Crossing a bridge and traveling down a dirt road, I reach this structure. It's the St. Peter's Church and it's here where my family and I park, put on mosquito repellent and enter, enter the hot summer air. We have arrived. What we see are people spread out in a huge field beside the church. Some people I know, some people I don't. But I still know them somehow because all of them are members of my family. My family has been having reunions in this place my entire life. All of us come from a bloodline, of course, the same grandparents, aunties, and uncles. But we all come from separate places today. Winnipeg, Selkirk, Peguis, Brokenhead, and others. People visit, but there's generally a separation. Clusters, in fact. Circles built around families. There's the Fleurys, the Thomases, the Simards, and of course, the Sinclairs. We're a community, but one divided by space and time, and this is evident in the very field where we hold our reunions. We are all descendants of the original Pegwa settlement on the Red River, a mixture of Cree and Anishinaabe and other communities in what became known as the St. Peter's Settlement. Our ancestors lived here in this place for centuries. When Europeans arrived, like Lord Selkirk, we signed agreements to share this territory and to live amongst one another in mutual prosperity. Namely, when we uh, had furs to trade and we wanted some of that cool technology that you have, <laughs> we came and saw you, and when you wanted to know how to handle the winter and some of the mosquitoes, you came to us. In 1871, members of the St. Peter's Indian Settlement agreed to the terms of Treaty 1. Signing this agreement, we believed, affirmed our claim to this rich, fertile, and valuable land, our home. You see, St. Peter's was a community of change. When Europeans arrived, it, wasn't, it was just a new addition, not a life-ending event. I'm not saying there wasn't disruptions and conflicts, but when Europeans arrived, we, we altered our cultural and life practices in ways that participated fully in a growing world. Like whenever we did when communities joined us, we have constantly adjusted to new practices and new ways of life. We became farmers, we built new homes. Some of us, like Chief Peguis, became Christian. For these reasons and others, St. Peter's became one of the richest settlements in Canada. But we never ceased being citizens of St. Peter's ever. Until one day, when our neighbors looked out and saw the same thing. Opportunistic land and resource-hungry settlers from the nearby town of Selkirk rallied the governments of Manitoba and Canada, asking them for this land. They were successful. And in 1907, Justice Hector Howell recommended that our community be removed and relocated north. The Indians were in the way of progress, Howell argued. They were in the way of development. The removal was one of the most violent and devastating chapters in Manitoba history. Aware of the legalities around such a move, Howell decided to hold a land surrender vote. In the days before, leaders were hands offered bribes, but when officials arrived, people refused to participate. They were defiant. Aware that they could not win, agents refused to hold the vote. They instead offered whiskey and bribes. The next afternoon, during a time when most citizens were away, officials immediately declared that a vote would be held. The surrender document was then read only in English, and it was announced that anyone who voted yes would immediately receive $90. There were several non-residents present, and no record of who was voted was kept. The result was announced, 107.98, in favor of the surrender. And later, an act of parliament was passed to entrench the decision. 
The years following the removal can only be called a flood, a flood of violence, removal, devastation, poverty, and atrophy. Residents of St. Peter's were forced to move to what is now known as Peglas Indian Reserve, a territory over 100 kilometers north that was inadequate for farming and prone to flooding. Those of us that remain, like my family, were forced to squat on what was once our land. We endured harassment from police and were arrested. None of us, no matter where we went though, ever lost a love for our home. In 1934, charged with trespassing on his own land, Murdo Sutherland said it best to a Selkirk judge who asked him why he doesn't just leave. And he said, I'm not going. I want to die where I was born. The devastating legacy of the removal continues here too, in our family gathering. It endures in the silence when we first meet, in our clusters of families, in the spaces between us. That is, until the food comes out. Around the barbecue, hot dogs and hamburgers are the first time we really break down our borders as a family. It's the first time people mingle, mix, and share space. Amongst the picnic tables, there's laughter sharing and lots and lots of eating. And of course, there's my Auntie Diane's potato salad. A mixture of potatoes, carrots, macaroni, mayonnaise, and what she calls her secret ingredient. My Auntie Potato Salad is one of the highlights of our reunions. It's awesome, and it's also gone in minutes. Let's just appreciate it. Oh, there she is, okay. <laughs> Auntie Diane's one of my family's best cooks. She's not only one of our matriarchs, she's also a storyteller, a joker, and one of the strongest women I've ever met. She's also someone who will remind you if you don't rem remember where you came from. After we eat, people sit together, visit, and usually a water fight breaks out. Then it's time for the candy scramble. There's a water fight right there. It's time for the candy scramble, Sarah's favorite time. And not only that, but uh, then the highlight of the gathering, of course, which is the races. The only rule of the races is that everyone gets a prize. And if you'll take a look, there's Sarah in her first race right there. <laughs> Everybody gets in the action, even the old men. The prize for us, though, is that we don't have a heart attack. <laughs> and before we go home, there's the family photographs. In these pictures, there's no dividing lines, no spaces between us, only our family. <clears throat> Standing on the exact site where our government agents and settlers stole our home, we come together and we occupy it. We come home as a community, as members of St. Peter's. In, uh, in my work, as a writer and professor, I'm often asked what motivates me. I'm asked why I do what I do, why I say what I say, and it's because of stories like St. Peter's, my family, and of course, stories of potato salad. Stories, as I discovered, is what we are. It's what guides our work. It's what makes us who we are. If we add ourselves to the world around us to fill the spaces and to combine ourselves with the earth and become a part of it through relationships, this is what stories are all about. If we do not speak, there is only absence, erasure, and removal. When we do tell our stories, we are present here and alive. This principle has guided my work. I'm most interested in Aboriginal stories that speak of relationships, resistance, violence, and resisting violence and resilience. I found this particularly true in our province. Our home is filled with stories, powerful visions, and experiences. We only have to listen and allow ourselves to learn from the people who have been here for millennia. And I learned this from my family. This summer, we'll do it again. We'll travel out to St. Peter's Church and we'll remake our lives again. And I learned this from St. Peter's. I learned this from potato salad. Miigwech. <laughs>